So recording. Yep. Okay, cool. So welcome Farhad. Very happy to have you here. It's the first episode of the podcast that I've been planning to create for a while. And the whole goal, I guess, is to try and give voice to people who are struggling, people who are trying to have their rights respected. They want to be heard. So you're right here in Brisbane. Sadly, we can't meet up in person. We're having to do this video call because you're in detention as a refugee. And I'd like today to ask you questions about your life, how you first came to Australia, what it is like in basically imprisoned by the Australian government, your hopes of future, and maybe we'll be able to conclude discussing this upcoming attempt by the Australian government to possibly ban the use of phones uh, by refugees in, in detention. So basically something like this, this Zoom call that we're having right now, I mean, you, this would be stopped under the new legislation, right? You would have no outs access to the outside world, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll end with that maybe. But first, Farhad, do you want to um, sort of explain your story, where you come from? Um, you're an engineer, so how you learned your trade as an engineer, um, what your life was like before you made the journey to Australia? Uh, thanks, Roy. This is really uh, an amazing opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I grew up in, in Iran uh, yeah. or Persia, whatever you call it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I became a civil engineer back home. I used to be a project manager. And uh, I had a comfortable life back home as, as an engineer. Uh, I enjoyed my uh, my life there, but things didn't really go well as my uh, uh, political involvement in against my uh, cruel government, mm. and uh, I had to leave my country. Uh, I'm sorry if I uh, it's my my situation is a bit uh, unique, and uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to go through details. Mm -hmm. uh, why I had uh, left my country because that's uh, it could put me in in danger even here in Australia. So yeah. uh, yeah. I just briefly, yeah, explained that uh, because of uh, the comments that I made against my government, and on top of that, against uh, some rules which I believe uh, were cruel towards people and towards uh, their freedom. Uh, I had to leave my country. So I left my country in 2013, came to Indonesia, and then uh, unfortunately I got on a boat, came to Australia in, uh, in July 2013. July 2. Uh, well, apparently, yeah, uh, I was on the ocean when they introduced a new uh, policy, which they call it 19th July uh, policy. So based on this, uh, uh, policy, whoever comes after 19 July 2013 will not be resettled in Australia. Yeah. So we, we ended up being like 4,500 people in Christmas Island who came after this policy. And then they started sending us to uh, offshore processing centers, either in uh, Manus Island in Papua New Guinea or in Nauru. And uh, Eventually, those, uh, those centers were full, so they couldn't send anyone else. Then they ended up having another uh, like 1,400 in uh, Christmas Island, which they couldn't send it to these islands. So they mm -hmm. sent something around 1,500 uh, 1, manas, same number to Nauru, and another uh, like 1,400 something in Christmas Island. And we thought this, uh, this rule or this policy going to be for everyone. But fortunately for those who remained in uh, Christmas Island, they were brought to mainland Australia in uh, 2015. And now they have been in a community for, for five years. Yeah. They're working, contributing to the uh, society and they are enjoying their life. But for us, things were completely different. Yeah. We were 
exiled on those uh, on those islands, either Manas or Nauru. And uh, finally, last year in 2019, based on uh, Medivac legislation, some of us could come to Australia for medical treatment. Uh, I think something around 180 came under uh, Medivac legislation. Yeah. And uh, he, some of us came to Brisbane, some Melbourne, and uh, we are still in detention. I have been in detention for 15 months in Australia, in Anshul, yeah. wow. on top of six years on uh, Manus Island. Wow, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's my story. Yeah. <laughs> sure. it, it's, a, it's, it's an incredible story. Maybe we could start... So I, I totally understand why um, you wouldn't be able to discuss some of the details about what happened in Iran, because in the course of some of my activism uh, to do with, say, Uyghurs in China, um, I know just the reach these types of governments have, even when you're in Australia, they threaten people's family members, they threaten people on an ongoing basis. And so people cannot speak out, even in Australia, it's so horrible. Um, could you could you explain? Could we could we go back to the start when you when you were going to go on that boat to Australia? So, did you know about the Australian government's policies? Um, did did you expect that? Did you ever expect the um, the long detention period that you were going to go through? Did you ever know that? Did you ever like? Um, what was it a surprise to you that you were detained and? and sent to Christmas Island? Well, to be honest, I had absolutely no idea. Yeah, what as, was your understanding? Uh, when I arrived... Well, uh, like, what Sorry, did what you, yeah, what, what did you understand Australia um, to be like, and, and what were you hoping to, like, find in Australia as a refugee? Well, first of all, I didn't mind anywhere. I just, I, I was looking for a safe country to seek asylum. I yeah. didn't plan to come to Australia. Yeah. Uh, Australia happened to me because the only person that I could find to take me to a safe country, uh, he said that he could send me only to Australia. He had some connections to send people to Australia. That's all. Yeah. So I didn't mind. Uh, it could be, you know, a European country for me. Yeah. And based on my uh, particular matter, I couldn't seek asylum in, in the, even in Indonesia. Uh, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot go through it. And oh, no, it's it okay, I understand. Much better uh, understanding for your audience if they knew uh, what was the reason that I couldn't uh, uh, seek asylum in, either in, in uh, Indonesia or any, anywhere else. Yeah. So, and that's because of, uh, actually, because of uh, my family safety. Yeah. I have a friend here who, not here, I mean, he was on Manus, and he uh, kept saying why he left con his, his country, and then, which was Iranian, uh, actually, uh, mm. nationality. And then his family back home got threatened by the government if uh, he is not going to uh, drop it off and uh, stop talking about this kind of matters, they will arrest his, uh, his father. And mm. actually, twice he was questioned by authorities. So for mm. my uh, safety and my family's safety, uh, it's not really uh, smart to, uh, to talk about that. But about Australia, uh, to be honest, I, I was thinking, and I still I believe that Australia mm. is a welcoming uh, mm. country and people, we have a lot of you know, lovely, caring people out there who are really uh, uh, fighting for our freedom. People like you, uh, it's, it's amazing to see this, uh, this kind of support. And I think the, the initial plan by sending people to offshore processing was actually keep people out of sight, out of sight, mm -hmm. out, 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 of, out of sight, out of mind. You have a saying like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the government tried to, uh, to, to hide us. And yeah. now this cruelty is revealed. Yeah. Everyone knows what happened to us for so long. So I didn't really mean uh, to come to Australia, it just happened to me, and I thought Australia is a, you know, it's a, it's a country with uh, human rights. They appreciate mm -hmm. uh, people who stands up for their rights, and I thought, okay, 
why not I go to this country, yeah. seek asylum, and then uh, I'll be a part of this society, contribute back to the society, and that could be a win-win for yeah. both sides. Yeah, of course. But it you're didn't work out English, for me. You're, you're fluent in English. You're you've got these skills as an engineer. I mean, you've got so much that you could contribute to Australian society, and yet, yeah, again, like the government has tried to keep people like you out of sight and out of mind because they fear conversations like this, I think, between Australian Australians and refugees. Because when you have conversations like this, you see the commonalities between us that we're just all human beings, that that we all have the same like desire for freedom and the 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 desire to just live safe, happy lives, free from persecution. They don't want us to have conversations like this, I think. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, uh... Uh, I, I'm a human, just like everyone out there. And yeah, of course. What I want is a simple life. Yeah. That's all I want. I want. Uh, I want a a fair chance to be given. Yeah. To be able to contribute in, in, in the society. Why the government keeps me in a, in a, in this situation and spend billions of dollars on on the whole industry? I call it an industry. Yeah. Because it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, you think a million of dollars comes to me, honestly? No, it goes to different parties. So cool. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The yeah. But the contractors, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It's an industry. It's like an industrial complex. Prison industrial yeah. complex. Absolutely. So, uh, but here I am. Uh, I have to go through uh, every kind of stress for, you know, for whatever reasons uh, every now and then and now it's been a, a few months that all of us all of uh, my fellow brothers here in different detentions uh, either in uh, hotel detentions which is which is a bit funny to be honest to keep people in hotels mm -hmm. as to use hotels as a detention for for so long for like 15 we have people in a kangaroo point who have been there for like 20 months, 20, 22 months there yeah, inside a room. Yeah. No, no, yeah. we are, we are located at the middle of Brisbane. Yeah, right in the middle. We have never tasted freedom. Yeah. In, in KP, I used to sit in the balcony and see people are walking around uh, yeah. with, with their beloved ones, walking their dogs. Yeah. And I love dogs actually. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I wish to have that opportunity as a human being, you know? Yeah. Is that really a lot to ask? Yeah, no, of course not. Of course not. Like, that's, what, that's what's just so shocking about the government's tre treatment of people like you because you're just a human being. You just, want, you just want the same access to opportunities like all Australians. You just want a simple life. Yeah, it, I'm, sorry, I'm so sad, bro. That I'm, I'm so sorry that my government is doing this in our name. It's... It's so significant to me. Well, no, it's not in. It's not under your name, honestly. Uh, we thought it's under your name when we were on Manus because we didn't see this amazing support from people. But now we are seeing this, uh, this support, and uh, that's so clear to us uh, so that uh, the government doesn't have the support from mm -hmm. uh, people, ordinary people on the ground, and that's uh, so lovely and amazing to see it yeah yeah could could i ask you bro um going back when you first uh like got on the boat what was that like when you when you got on a boat heading for australia were you fearful what was it what was this boat like like what was the actual trek like like as a refugee trying to get to australia back in 2013 well as i said at the same it, it, it was a, a complex feeling yeah uh getting on a on a tiny boat and uh, well, we say put your life on the uh, uh, on your hand. Yeah, it was like that. It was like a gamble, to be honest. Yeah, and I'm sure no one does that unless you have to. Yeah, uh, that, that that trip is so risky. To yeah. be honest, the the uh, uh, the assuredness of being uh, alive on that trip is less than uh, maybe well, I I would say twenty percent. Because yeah, many people not have died. Not even a coin flip. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so it was a, a mixture of feeling that uh, what would happen if I reach Australia and what would happen if I die here. And yeah. to be honest, the fear of uh, you know dying somewhere that even no one can find your body yeah. is is beyond imagination. And what was it like to me, I'm like that. Sorry. Oh, what was it like to confront death like that? To like to think that? Oh, you bro, it's it's it, it's. I cannot put it in words, to be honest. Yeah. And I'm. Uh, uh, my character is uh, is just like um, I don't escape easily. But to be honest, and that's uh, like three nights on the boat. Uh, I was, to be honest, I was so scared. It it was so scary, especially at at night time, because. Yeah. Everywhere were dark. You couldn't see even a few meters uh, ahead, and we had the feeling that this uh, boat people. I mean, do, those who are uh, uh, actually uh, heading us to the to the Australia, uh, they might run away because we heard different stories that you know uh, they might uh, just leave people on an ocean and uh, jump in the ocean and just. Uh, Oh, uh, you're talking about the smugglers right now? Yeah, smugglers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it, what uh, was it like being like putting your hands, putting your life in the hands of someone you didn't trust like that, like a smuggler? What were those people? Yeah. Well, uh, imagine, would you do that unless you have to or you're forced yeah. to? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we had to. That's That was That's the correct. only option we had. Yeah, it was, it was a really risky gamble for us, which yeah. the, the person... The percentage of uh, winning this uh, gamble was less than twenty percent. So still either really way, uh, staying back was just like uh, being killed by our government. Coming yeah. on the ocean, you have twenty percent. Which one would you take? Yeah. So for you, you would confront an eighty percent chance of death because at least there was that small glimmer of hope. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Given what has happened to you the last seven years, like all the pain you've gone through being unjustly detained by the Australian government, if 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 your past self would have known got you would go through this, do you still think you would have gone on that boat? Uh, yes and no. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, because I had to. No, yeah. because I think. Uh, the Australia option wasn't a right uh, choice. Yeah. So I might have got on a boat, but somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, in past seven years, I have lost three of my close friends in Manus Island. Yeah. In 2014, uh, unrest, uh, it, that was February 2014, yeah. A dear friend of mine, a, a guy called Reza Barati, yep. he was killed inside detention center. Yeah. Security guards, local security guards, yeah. and also uh, local people who attacked our uh, compound, killed him inside the detention center wow. based on whatever order they got from whoever, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So, and then in 2015, Another fr friend of mine, a guy called Hamid Khazai, he passed away because of a simple infection in his, uh, in his leg, which could be cured by, I don't know, really ordinary uh, yeah. procedures here in Australia. But he was just left behind without having a proper treatment back in Manus because there was nothing. Yeah. So... Yeah, then the infection got into his body and he passed away. And the last person who committed suicide, unfortunately, and today is, I think today, today is, uh, are you okay, Day? Yeah. And I feel this is my obligation to talk about this dear yeah. friend of mine who taught me to, who taught, who taught me English, actually. I yeah. owe him a lot. Yeah, well. An, Af an Afghan doctor who used to be my roommate yeah. for two years. Uh, he was brought here to Australia in 2017 and had to spend like a year in hospital based on his uh, mental uh, state and depression and things like that. 
And then he was left in, in community without any support or any rights for another year. And unfortunately, last year he committed suicide in uh, Brisbane. And yeah. that tells a lot. Can you justify a person who have heaps of dreams for future to commit yeah. suicide? A well-known person uh, as a doctor, he was uh, actually a qualified doctor. He studied in China mm. and he could have done much better if he was given a fair chance. Yeah. This is not the Australia that I know. And I'm sure, I'm sure uh, neither you do you think that this is really a fair chance to everyone? No, yeah, of course not. This man, he was a doctor, and and he was yes. so he was in community detention. What what was that like for him that last year? Well, I'm not sure if you know what is community detention. Com basically, yeah. community detention uh, is just like being in detention, but you are free to come and go. So you yeah. have absolutely no rights when it comes to work, when it comes to uh, even doing voluntary jobs. Yeah, you have no right to do voluntary jobs. So it's a kind of you know, uh, Limbo. being alive and have a sort of freedom within the community where you are. So yeah. if, if you are given a community detention in Brisbane, you cannot even travel to, let's say, Sunshine Coast. Yeah. So you have to be in, uh, in Brisbane. Uh, and um, being in a city, having no right at all uh, and being under heaps of uh, sorts of uh, depression for a few years, yeah. Then lead him to a to the way that he ended up his life. Yeah, and and uh, sadly there have been number of suicides among refugees in detention, and at KP there's been a number of suicide attempts. Right, it's just so yes. Yeah, it's so sad to see people committing or attempting uh, suicide. Mm -hmm. It's it's easy to talk about it, uh, bro, but yeah. it's really difficult to deal with it. Oh yeah, we yeah. have we have we have actually three guys here in Baida at the moment who are twenty two or twenty three years old, and they were fifteen or sixteen when they were sent to uh, Manas and Nauru. Yeah, actually, oh sorry, these three were sent to. Uh, to Nauru. Yeah. They were teenagers and for a few years of the, the teenagerhood and all their adulthood, they have been in detention. Yeah. Is this fair for someone who have committed absolutely no crime to be in detention for several years? I'm sure no one stands for that. No, of course not. It's it's crazy because like these are people my age. I'm 21 this year, and you know doing ordinary things like doing ordinary 21 year old things, and and people you know my age right here in Brisbane instead they're just basically in prison behind bars, no crime, never been charged with anything, with no prospects of ever seeing freedom or hope. Like I mean, it's just it's sick to think about that people my age prison for no crime right here in the same city it's so it's so crazy man like i mean you're right here in brisbane you're at bida and i'm right here in brisbane we're probably like five ten kilometers away from each other right now but i couldn't visit you we have to talk via satellite link via zoom because you're just held behind bars with no charge it's just it's and i don't I, I don't take take this as granted yeah this device that i'm using to talk to you might be taken from me in a couple of weeks yeah can you imagine that see it's just so sick because i mean the only reason we can have a conversation like this like just you know person to person human to human is because you have you still have access to something like a phone or a laptop or whatever i mean because you're not you're not charged with any crime you're not you're not a criminal you're a human being, you've been charged with no crime. Why should you be barred access to the wider community? Why should you be barred access to the wider world? And this Absolutely, that's, that's the point. And uh, especially for us, 
uh, we have been under heavy security measures for several years. Back yeah. in Manas, uh, for a few years, whatever communication, we, we used to have no phone in um, Manas for a few years. And yeah. whatever communication we made with outside world was monitored by authorities. Yeah. So they know who we are. We are all uh, checked and cleared by security measures. Yeah. And to be honest, bro, I don't know. To be honest, uh, I mean it, really. I mean it. Yeah. What is the reason to uh, put people under this kind of life and suffers and struggles for so long? Yeah, I know. Bro, bro it, it just, it's just, wow, it's, it's just so hard to hard to discuss bro like the pain that you have to suffer for no reason could you could you explain what life was like on manus and and i mean like what is it like when you're sort of just in this limbo like no man's land where you're not charged with any crime and yet you're imprisoned and you don't have a time frame a horizon on which you might be free what is it like to live in that under those conditions well for for first a few years we had nothing actually back in Manus. Yeah. We had no TV, we had no even newspaper, uh, and it was a super simple life, like maybe who knows, two hundred years ago. Yeah. So and four of us in, in each room and double uh, uh bunks and also uh I used to be in a compound without uh air conditioning. Oh, and I... we have one of those big fans inside our room that it's, uh, a, tropi- it's a tropical yeah tropical. it's a tropic it's yeah. it's it's really hot it's really even, hot even hotter than say like iran right yeah 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 absolutely yeah, yeah. much yeah. hotter than i am coming from a place uh in west of iran that oh, yes. during winter we have uh we have snow in in our city oh yes yeah but yeah for me it was completely a different uh uh, climate and it was really hard to deal with for mm-hmm. many of the guys from uh, Iran uh, and Afghanistan it was really hard to deal with that environment yeah, translated into a tropical climate like, yeah, yeah 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 so uh, after 9 a.m. it was it, it was impossible to stay inside the room you had to leave the room it was so what, hard what, what temperature would we be talking like 40 degrees well uh, the ter- the temperature is not the problem itself. The, humidity. the problem comes from humidity. Yeah, yeah. the humidity is always uh, above, I think, 80, 90%. Yeah. And the, the temperature is, I think, it's around 30 something. 30 37. Something, 80, 90% humidity, though, feels yes. like in the mid 40s. Yeah, it feels yeah. like hell, bro. Yeah. It was, really, uh, it was really hard to deal with that on top of all uh, other kind of depression that we had what yeah. is what is the future or what's going to happen to us or uh what is the plan or when we are going to be taken away from this place so we it wasn't really one matter that we had to deal with it was a complex of yeah. difficulties that we had to deal with every single day yeah and it must have been like prison, right? You, you, did you feel like you were being punished the way the conditions were? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was prison because uh, there, was, uh, there, was four, there were four different compounds in Manas Island and we could not even go through uh, one compound to, to the other one. Yeah. And if we talked through fences, we were told to, to not talk even through fences with other yeah. detainees uh, in different compounds. So it was a really strict. Uh, zone. Were, most of the guards were local. What was your contact like with Australians at this point? Were they, how many like Australians were around in the camp, and were they guards? Were... Well, we had we had uh, Australian guards. Uh, yeah. Like I would say at the beginning, like uh, like twenty in each compound. Yeah. And heaps of local guards. Uh, mm-hmm. and then gradually they dropped the number I mean the foreigner security guards mm-hmm. uh, basically uh, Aussies and yeah. then eventually in 2017 
they, uh, I mean, the locals were in charge of managing the uh, compounds in the mats. What, what was that shift like? And what was, what was it like? Did you ever speak with these Australian guards? What was that relationship like? And how did things change as Manus guards took over? Well, to be honest, and, uh, you know, uh, we, had, we had good and like everyone, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we had good and bad people, but uh, they were all there to do their duties. Mm. And they were really strict regarding to their duties some of the some of them uh uh could feel what we are going through yeah some of them not really cared about what's happening there and it was really hard for us to find who is uh who is having a heart uh mm -hmm. towards uh, our situation and at the end of the day they couldn't really do anything yeah yeah well, like the ones without a heart, like what was it like dealing with them? Well, they uh, understood us. You could talk and make like a conversation with them and, you know, ask them uh, to uh, just uh, try and help you with your English. And yeah. Basically try to make a conversation. That's it. Yeah. That's all they could do. Yeah. The, the ones with, without the heart, though, the, the, like the more cruel ones, what was that like? Oh, they had no flexibility at all. Mm. And they were just, uh, they were by the book and no flexibility at all. If you are one minute late for your meal, no chance to get a meal. Mm. If you are one minute late for your uh, computer session, with, which uh, used to happen twice a week, 45 minutes, mm. uh, uh, time, uh, no chance at all, and yeah. goodbye. No phone phone time. We used to have twice a week uh, phone time uh, for half an hour and uh, twice uh, computer time. So if we were late for whatever reason, for example, you had a you had a medical appointment, and uh, it was uh, uh, during your phone time, then no way to get your phone time. So th we used to to be told that you have to uh, prioritize which one do you want, medical wow. or phone time. Wow, that was just those petty type, those petty cruelties, those petty sorts of humiliations that just really drive home, drives home just how like totalitarian the system is. It's, it's really like, Absolutely. A, it's like a prison, yeah. I was told many times to go back to my country by security guards. Mm, yeah. I, I was told if you don't like it here, go back to your, your home country. And, and I used, to, uh, uh, my, my English wasn't really, uh, well, still it's not good, but no, it got, was even worse than this. You've got very good English. Like, you know, we're, we're <laughs> great. Yeah. But and um, I yeah. try to tell them it's not about me. It's about human rights. You know, yeah. uh, and it's good to have some uh, compassion on, uh, on this matter. You know that we have done nothing wrong and uh, we have been punished because of uh, uh, policy and because of a government uh, who tries to push for the uh, propaganda and for the agenda. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, they had no mercy. And even here in, uh, in Brisbane, either you are... Uh, doesn't matter really Brisbane or Melbourne, either you are in a hotel or in, uh, in detention, Wh whatever we tell them or ask them or whatever conversation we make with security guards, it has to be reported. And mm -hmm. I think, uh, who knows, maybe thousands of pages reports in our files, whatever conversation we make, they, they don't really care. They just report us. Wow. So like, there must be, would you expect there must be like thousands of pages on you, Farhad, in some Australian government sort of like record system? Like, <laughs> well, uh, uh, my roommate, yeah. who, is, who is a quiet guy and not really vocal at all, he, his file is 80,000 pages. 80,000? 80, 80,000 pages. Mine should be, uh, I don't know, maybe 200,000 pages. Wow. <laughs> That is just 
that's just crazy. Wow. I, I know, I know, I know. Like 80,000, 200,000 pages just worth of reporting every single detail of your life. Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, I have been told by those who have a bit of heart, before I start my conversation with them, they say, uh, we know you, you're a good man, but whatever you tell us, we have to report it. Uh, you, know, you know what? One, one day, a historian will go through those records, man, and like, they're going to be able to like, reconstruct just like the very petty level of cruelties, the very petty cruelties that they inflict on you guys every single day, and your story is going to be memorialized in all of history. Like these, these, these criminals, the, these criminals, I, I see them as criminals the way they've treated you. Like they're not going to go unpunished. They're going. Well, well let me give you an example. You are living in a neighborhood. Yeah. You have a neighbor who is a strong man and another one who is based on his uh, physical and appearance is a weak man. Yeah. What would be your what would be your reaction when you see the strong man is punching this guy every single day? Yeah, it's bullying. I do believe if you just if you just turn your face and walk away, then there will be a day that you have to punch this guy back because he comes for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. When you turn your face, this is happened. This cruelty happens to innocent people. Yeah. And today is my turn. Tomorrow is your turn. It's true. Because if they, if they are capable of doing this to innocent people, then they can do it to everyone. Yeah. You should judge a government by how it treats its most vulnerable citizens. And if, if, this, is what it, if this is how the Australian government behaves when it thinks that people are not watching and it can get away with it, then, I mean, that's the true nature of this government. And, I mean, one day... One day, these, these sorts of cruelties will be inflicted on ordinary citizens as well, not just refugees. I truly believe, like, your point is right. So, and you think this, uh, this conversation doesn't make uh, any changes to my uh, situation? Of course it will. Yeah. I will be punished for what, we are, what I'm saying here, what I'm talking about here. I will be punished three months ago I was punished because of my advocacy, because I, I tried to, uh, to help my, myself and others who are vulnerable. And at like 7 a.m. morning, several ERT guys, ERT stands for Emergency Response Team, rushed into my room, rolled me over on my face, handcuffed me, and brought me to a uh, bite up. Yeah. And they did not put me in residential uh, compound. They put me in higher security compound with those who are waiting for the deportation. Yeah. Why? Punishment for because, your activism. Yeah. Why? Because I tried to, to make awareness. So yeah. when it goes to, to this kind of action, to be honest, I, I, I ain't see any difference between my government and Australian government. Yeah. Back home, if you do like political uh, movement against the government, they they will have no mercy on you. And here he's saying, you know what really frustrates me, bro. Like over the course of my activism, and I focused a lot on China because I've got quite a fr lot of Uyghur, Tibetan, Hong Kong friends who they've got families back home who are threatened, and this is Australia's largest trading partner, and many powerful people in Australia want us to look the other way in the face of these terrible human rights abuses simply because they make a lot of money trading with China. And yet yeah, speaking with these people, I, I see their story and the cruelties that they face facing down the Chinese government, it's absolutely terrible. And then, and many Australian government officials, they're, they're, they're very prepared to speak very publicly against that. So, in Australia, Scott Morrison, he's very, he's very vocal when he criticises the Chinese government's human rights abuses. Number of members of parliament, especially on the right-wing side of politics, they're very, very vocal when it comes to criticising the Chinese government's human rights abuses. And that's great because these are terrible human rights abuses and we should be speaking out. But I wonder why are they then enabling basically the same behaviour that they're condemning overseas? Why do they enable it and actually empower it right here at home? 
why do they speak out about human rights abuses overseas and then inflict these terrible human rights abuses right here at home? Everything that they talk about when it comes to China, the terrible treatment of people, the threats to people's families, but like, especially, you know, when people in China are punished for speaking out politically, Australian government officials, they're always very vocal to criticize the Chinese government when it tries to punish people for speaking out politically. But then you speak out politically right here in Australia. You're, you're, you're here in Australia. I regard you as an Australian, bro. You're entitled to free speech. And yet you are punished by this government for speaking out. It's exactly what China does to dissidents over there. So how can people talk about China and then not look right here at home as well? That's, for me, the thing that really shocks me. It's so terrible that so many government MPs, they'll talk about China, but then they do this to you right here at home. I can't believe how you've been treated, how they actually handcuffed you, they transported you to high security so that you wouldn't be able to be active, so that you wouldn't be able to organize people over at KP at Kangaroo Point, because you were obviously a leader among the, among the men there. Bro, uh, I will give you a consent, written consent form to yeah. act on my behalf and ask the government to release all my FOI to you. And yeah. if you could find one point in my seven or eight years detention yeah. that I have done anything wrong against anyone, then I will give the authority to you to punish me as, as someone uh, who, who I believe uh, is a neutral person there. Yeah. But, but why I get punished while I have done nothing absolutely wrong. I, I try my best to be respectful to everyone. Uh, doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. Either a detainee here or CERC officer or ABF officer doesn't really matter to me because yeah. this is the way I have been brought up. This is the way that I was taught. If you want respect, then do it to others. Yeah, I believe yeah. in karma. So it yeah. com comes around, goes away. That's I, it. But why should, why am I getting uh, punished because of trying to, to defend my uh, basic human rights after eight years? Eight years. Honestly, still you don't see that right for me to speak up after being in this situation for eight years? Yeah. There is something wrong here if you are not seeing that right. They just want to silence you, bro. Like, if they pass this legislation to ban mobile phones and, I mean, do they just want you to be languishing in silence in Baita, never to be heard of from again by any Australian? Absolutely. That's, that's the whole point about this uh, migration amendment. That's all. Because they say that it was actually, they say that it's to investigate, to make sure that there is no child exploitation material on, the, on refugee inmates' phones or to make sure that there's no terrorist material or whatever. But like, let's be serious. It's very clear that this legislation in, is designed to take away the, the, like, the access you would have and the access other activists have to the Australian community. They see how powerful it is when you speak to an Australian and you get your voice heard. And what they're going to do on day one of this legislation going is they would take your stuff and they would, they would just muzzle you and silence you. They don't want refugees in Australia talking to other Australians. Well, am I saying all refugees are fantastic, fantastic people? Of course not. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like every community, we have good people, good and bad people everywhere. Yeah. But can I be treated uh, as a result of someone's else behavior no that's not right if someone no. does something wrong that particular person has to be punished of course we yeah we no don't doubt about that punishment. we in australia we don't believe in collective punishment that's for a country like north korea or china in north korea a dissident they will punish three generations of their family inter three generations of their family in a concentration camp if they speak out as punishment for one person's crime. We don't believe in collective punishment in a country like Australia. We're supposed to be supporting human rights and supporting freedom of speech and supporting the dignity of the human person. We're supposed to believe in the rule of law in this country that, that like we apply the law fairly and equally to every single person, regardless of their background or status. And so why would you be unfairly targeted for the actions of another?
that that goes completely against the principle of the rule of law. Well, what's happening here? One of the main uh, rules here in detention is collective punishment. Yeah, that's one of the main. If if someone does something wrong, then everyone everyone will be punished. That's no doubt, no doubt about it. Could you give me an example, like maybe even something at Bida that's happened? Uh, let me give you an example in uh, in Manas Island in yeah. 2014. Almost everyone went through a hunger strike. Yeah. And then uh, authorities came after they saw that we are keep going with this hunger strike. Authorities came and uh, like arrested actually the leaders and put them in a horrible situation for for like three months in jail for for, for some time in jail in PNG yeah. and then in a isolated compound and then another isolated compound and some of them were were not really uh, leader during that uh, hunger strike at all so everyone then then uh, during 2014 riot another example uh, we we get punished and having one meal not a real uh, meal actually maybe half a real meal once a day because uh, because some incident happened in uh, February 2014. So yeah. it's, it's a collective of, uh, of course. And, it, and that's shocking to hear. And it really makes you question who in the Australian government is responsible for these decisions? Because surely Circo is not, Circo and the security contractors, they can't make those decisions on their own. Absolutely. Well, they have some saying, but, but they something, are something as big as something as big as like, you know, reducing rations and meals and stuff like that. That would have to have been, that must be coming from elected Australian ministers. Absolutely. It, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It would be government yeah. policy. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, what do you expect uh, the government when they are trying to criminalize the refugees? We mm. are under a way that almost all of us are going to be criminalized. Yeah. What, I, I take you back to a couple of years ago when... Uh, there was the conversation between uh, uh, Malcolm Turnbull administration with Obama oh, to, yeah. uh, to reach a disagreement uh, for uh, yeah. swap refugees. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if you have seen the uh, uh, actual conversation between these two president and prime minister. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull uh, described us as good people who have been under heavy security for a long time. Yeah. And that was almost three years ago. I think that was 2017. And then two years ago, when we had the conversation about uh, Medivac uh, bill, we were described by the Home Affairs Minister as pedophiles, murderers, and uh, terrorists. Mm. So yeah. which one is correct? Yeah, which one is correct, exactly. And... It just, it's just an attempt to demonize refugees. It's just an attempt Absolutely. to Absolutely. That's all. That's all. To, to cut off the humanity from refugees so that ordinary Australians won't confront the situation. Well, what, I was uh, just right now when we, ha we, when we had dinner, a friend of mine, this is a simple thing. He said, it's been seven, seven eight years that I have not been able to eat with the actual spoon. Mm. Wow. Well. So small things like that. Small things, yeah, small things. We are missing a small things in life every single day because it's been so long. I, that just that just is makes me question things. Like, I mean, has there been a decision in the Australian government made by an Australian government do not allow refugees in detention access to spoons? I mean, like, where how are these decisions being made? Who is in charge? Who is responsible for this? Because there, there, are, there must be people responsible for what is happening. But the entire system is so secretive and opaque. Even Australian citizens can't understand what is happening. Well, uh, bro, this, is, uh, this has a long history behind it. Yeah. First of all, we are dealing with something called mandatory detention here in yeah. Australia, which was introduced in uh, 1992. 1992 by Labour government. Oh, yes, you're right. Kidding. Yeah. 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 And then we have uh, 
Tampa matter, which happened in 2000, and the boat which arrived in uh, Australia water and was uh, rescued by a Norwegian uh, ship, and they requested to be brought to Australia, but it was ignored by John Howard, and they were sent to to, uh, to Manus Island, I guess, and then they were all sent to New Zealand, and now they are proudly uh, New Zealand citizens. Many of them are there. And then in 2013, uh, unfortunately, again by Labour government, uh, they called for a policy called Pacific Solution. And based on that, we were all sent to uh, Manus and Nauru. And uh, then uh, liberals came to power and they just kept doing what they have promised. Yeah. And in past six, seven years, unfortunately, one of the main uh, games which played really a big thing on uh, Australia politics was refugees. Look mm. at 2013. What was the main slogan of LNP? Stop the boats. Yeah. That's why they got into power. Yeah. And then uh, who, is the pr who is the prime minister uh, right now? Scott Morrison. And he made his name as the Home Affairs. He, like, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And what, ha what happened between the current home affair uh, minister and uh, previous prime minister? So the whole politics is around, uh, you know, uh, how you could be cruel against refugees, yeah. then you will gain more. I, I think it's, I, I, tr I remember those days, you know, like where we had stopped the votes on Australian television every night and just the hatred, the hatred was just so intense. And uh, truly, bro, I, I see a shift now and it must be because of things like Medivac where people came to Australia and we can speak to people like you. And it was also because of the brave testimony of people like Beirut Bukhani and stuff. Like as more and more people find out about just the conditions you face, like, like I, you know, I've got family members who are like very conservative and, you know, they supported the Morrison, they supported Tony Abbott, Stop the Boats and all that terrible stuff. And like, I talked to them about KP and like, I talked to them about your individual story as, and you know, you humanize it and you say like, these are human beings. You, you actually explain it to them on a human to human le level where people can understand that human beings are suffering. And, and it's so hard for them to keep that, keep up that sort of rhetoric or oh, all refugees are terrorists or whatever. Like when, when people come face to face, like the demonization and the dehumanization, it falls away and people realize this is just sick and it's being carried out in our names. Like the support I think in the community for the protests surrounding KP and stuff, I think has truly been very strong. Do you, yeah, do, that support is you, oh, you absolutely. I'm, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm with you, hundred percent. Yeah, you, you think uh, that's why they are trying to take away our, our phones. Yeah, because yeah. they don't want people to see our human face. Yeah, you know? yeah. they want us to remain as a, as a, as a threat to the yeah. community. And what, what could be done if I have this uh, mobile phone in front of me and I have the chance to, to talk to you or to yeah. anyone else? Then. I will put a face on this uh, thread and yeah. let people see. No, that's not the case. There is, there has to yeah. be something behind that. Exactly. Like, because when I think of refugees now, I think my friend Farhad, who's right here in Brisbane, he's an engineer, he speaks English. He, he's suffered a lot. He wants to live here. I know he loves dogs. I want him, I, I know he wants to one day just be in the community, be able to walk dog, his dog, live a safe, ordinary life. You know, there's a human face I can put onto this thing. And that's what the government wants to take away. Like, they, they want the refugees to just be this sort of monolith, this group of terrorists and evil men that no one understands and everyone is scared of and everyone has to, has to hide them away. No, the reality is it's, it's people like you, ordinary human beings who are just suffering and they, flip, they fled their countries trying to find a better life and they want to contribute to this country. And, Absolutely. Yeah. We would love to contribute to your society. We would love to be a part of this society. I, uh, I would be more than happy the day that I have a fair chance, like any other Australians, to be a part of this society, to have a job, yeah. to pay tax, yeah, to, to pay. bring something positive to this land. 
why should I be kept in a situation that the government has spent billions of money on, on uh, this situation to keep me here while I can, I can do better outside? Yeah, yeah, of course, it makes no sense. Well, well how do you go, how do you keep going, bro? Like, how do you, um, like, like, in this situation, like, how do you keep going? How do you, like, keep yourself, like, from just utter despair, given the terrible stuff you have to face? Well, the, one of the main things that kept me, to be honest, uh, alive in past six, seven years was hope. I do believe in a day that I get my freedom. Yeah. And uh, I would be able to exercise my uh, basic human rights. And that, uh, seeing that day uh, keeps me alive every single day. Well, yeah. during, you know, like uh, routine activities, I do exercise twice a day, uh, wake up early morning, do uh, like 45 to one hour, uh, 45 minutes to one hour, uh, like cardio. And then uh, I do some online studies, which I, I love. And yeah. then, you know, talk to friends and afternoon, same again, do like uh, one hour activities, playing soccer. Uh, that's, that's our, basically, that's our life. Yeah. Watching a movie uh, on my phone, talking to my family back home, mm. or uh, sending texts to my friends like "draw yeah. uh, my brother here." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all I can do. Yeah. So, to be honest, uh, our phones are playing a, a really critical role in, de in detention. Yeah. And, uh, if they are going to take it away, then there will be a mess. What what do you think your life would be like if if the government succeeds with this legislation next month, where they want oh, to? I, have, I cannot even imagine it, honestly. Yeah. yeah, it would be so difficult. Yeah, it would be. It would. Would it be like going back to Manus, like those? Absolutely. Countries? Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, when I think about uh, early years in Manus now, I'm so shocked. How did I survive that? Yeah. Yeah. And I don't want to go back to that day at all. Yeah, of course, of course. Like, it, it's so cruel, bro, that they try and rob you of hope. It's like, they've robbed you of all your personal freedoms. You, they've robbed you of everything, basically. And now they want to try and rob you of hope. And it just, it just makes no sense. Like, at, at what point does it stop? What do they want here? Do they Yeah, want... exactly. That's the question. That's I mean... the question. When this cruelty has to end? When does when? It, yeah, d d like, does the government plan on keeping someone like you detained for the next, like, 40, 50 years? How does that work? How would that be sustainable? How would that ever work? I think the government is in, in a better position to answer that, but I want to keep that hope alive. I don't want to think that I will be here next week. Yeah. I have the hope every night when I close my eyes that early morning, I will be wake up by security guards, tell me to pack up because I'm getting my freedom. Yeah. I want to keep that hope alive every single day. Yeah. What is your message? Say, like, I, I have some MPs who follow me and stuff like that because of what I've done with China and everything. Like, what would your, your message be to, like, a member of parliament who was watching this? Like, because mine would be, you can give Farhad his freedom right here. I mean, you have the power with your vote to give this man freedom, to let him live free, live a normal life just like you and I? Well, I tried, to be honest, I tried to prepare something as yeah. a message today, but then I said, just leave it. Yeah. I will, I, will, I will say whatever comes to my heart at that moment. And now yeah. I want to talk through my heart, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I expect them to look at our human face. Yeah. We are not here to do something wrong. We are not here to take advantage of your welfare system. We are here for a fair chance to be given, to be a part of this society. Yeah. That's all. We don't want something extra on, you know, uh, rather than what you are giving to your citizens. Not even that for the start. Just give us our freedom. We will figure it out. Honestly, right now, I would be more than happy if the government or uh, authorities call me and say, this is your 
bridging visa, which basically by bridging visa, you have no right at all. Yeah. I will walk away and I will figure it out uh, myself. I don't need peop- uh, the government to support me. If I'm man enough, I can uh, support myself in, in yeah. the community. And I, I see that, uh, I see that potential energy in myself that I could uh, support myself. And yeah. not only me, everyone here, we, yeah. we are all people here, they are all young, they can work, they can, they can contribute to your society. Let us, let us to have that chance. We have been abandoned for yeah. so long. We have been pushed away for so long. This is time to give us just a break. Yeah, bro, it's very, very eloquent. You're, you're a great speaker. And for you to be speaking this in, in, in like a language you're not native to, I mean, it's, it's really incredible. Like those words are very eloquent, man, very affecting. Thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you, bro. I, man, it, it's such a, it, it, it you know, it, it, it touches something inside you. Like you, I truly don't think you're, you can be human if you, if you, if you listen to this story you've just told today and, and yet you would, you would not be affected by it. It's, it's like almost like you're not human. I, I just would ask people to try and imagine what life would be like to be like as Farhad as, as to be in your shoes, to like be in limbo for seven, eight years, taken away from K- Kangaroo Point because of your political activism, placed in higher security. Now they're threatening to take away your access to the wider world and your ability to speak out about what's happening to you. I mean, how would an ordinary person live like that? I know I couldn't live with like that. I have no idea how I, would keep, I could keep on going in that situation. Just the constant suffering and the constant, the, the, the attempt to constantly rob you of hope. Like, I mean, it's just so inhuman. It's, I, I can't imagine what I would do in your situation, bro. I, I don't know how I would keep going. I don't know how I would live. Like for you to still be here, bro, like to, to be here to share your story even after seven, eight years of you suffering like this. It's truly incredible. Like it's a testament to your strength because I don't know how I would be here after seven or eight years of that. And uh, let me take this opportunity and talk to uh, that, uh, well, that group of people who are against me and they are everywhere and totally it's fine to be uh, to opposing something as long as we stay uh, respectful to each other. I have no problem at all with that. But uh, let's forget about whatever we believe in. Just try to think about what you heard today yeah. and put yourself in my shoes just for five minutes. Just five minutes. Farhad is someone from amongst these all people. As someone who tries to represent them, and he he just want a fair chance. Yeah. He's not here to to screw our system. He's not here to do something wrong against us. He just want a fair chance to be a to be a part of to be one of us. Yeah, to be an Australian. Exactly, exactly. To be a proud a proud Australian and do something for this to, for this land. Yeah. Just for a moment, try to uh, to put yourself in my shoes, and uh, do not judge me by, based on my nationality or based on whatever you have heard about me, uh, about uh, I don't know about my color, about my uh, religion, or about where I'm coming from. And at the end of the day, I'm a human, and I do believe in humanity. Yeah. Just try to see this side of it. Yeah, of course. And, and bro, listen, I think you have already made a great contribution to Australia. I think what you've done, the role you've played, exposing the system, exposing these cruelties, standing up for justice and humanity, I think that makes you an Australian hero. I think you've already contributed a lot to this country, man. History will remember that. One day, I truly believe you will be regarded as an Australian hero and all these refugees who have suffered and who have continued on regardless in the face of that suffering and who have, have borne witness in the face of it, I think they will be regarded as Australian heroes too, bro. I think you have contributed so much to this country. Like, 
looking forward to that day, bro. Yeah, of course, bro. I, bro, I, honestly, I wish I wish I could hug you, brother. But like, it's it's sad. I mean, thank I'm, you. But one thank day, you. bro. I, one day we'll we will be together. You know, I, you will have your freedom one day. We we will have a great dinner together, man, and we'll we'll get to catch up as friends in person, not having to sure. go, not having to go through video link like this, man. <laughs> Hopefully, very soon, and uh, you promise me that you will in, invite me for a beer. Yes, of course, bro. We, we'll have a beer together, have a beer, and um, and bro, we'll we'll stay in contact. If if you do face punishment because of this video that you've recorded, please tell me. I'll do everything I can to try and raise up your voice and show people what you're suffering. So, bro, we'll stay in touch. We might even be able to do a sort of live thing on my Facebook sometime. Um, bro, I'm here for you. So, I thank you so much. Just just can't wait for the day that you know. I get to sit down and have a beer with you. Another great, another proud Australian. You know, I see Thank you as you. a great hero. So looking forward to that day. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank I you. really appreciate the time. You Thank take care, brother. I'll, I'll stop the recording now.